Okay, for this chapter, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the difference between the FICO score and the Vantage score. As we've discussed, the Vantage score is used by less than 10% of creditors. And for that reason, it is of little value to you. When all, the entire course is really going to be about the FICO score because that's the one that counts. The Vantage score is a score that's used for credit monitoring services. It has some uh, usefulness as an educational tool, but when you check your score with the credit monitoring services, don't get excited about the number that they give you. That number has no relationship to your FICO score. The only way to get your FICO score, other than applying for a loan, is to go to myfico.com and pay close to $50 for all three of your FICO scores. Now, when you do this, there is no ding to your credit report like there is when a lender pulls it, and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail as we go on with the course. Now, the Vantage credit scoring model is lenient in certain respects, so that you can expect that your FICO score is not going to be quite as good as your Vantage credit score. The Vantage credit score, for instance, forgives a debt that's paid. A FICO score will continue to, to make a negative impact on your score when a debt, even that's been paid, is on there for a total usually of seven years. The fact that the debt has been paid may help some, but they're more concerned with, FICO is more concerned, that is, with the fact that you did once have a problem. Even though the problem has been corrected, you did have that problem. And that problem is not usually expunged for seven years. The Vantage credit score will forgive you once you pay the debt. So don't let that fool you. Now, one thing, uh, if you're just starting out with uh, trying to, uh, to get a, a credit file going, you have what's called a thin credit file. A thin credit file is a file of someone that has used very little credit in their life, or, or maybe none at all. And as such, you will not even really appear to the credit reporting agencies. They don't even know you exist unless they begin to get information on you. The best way to start to get credit is to take out what's called a secured credit card. This can be distinguished from a prepaid credit card, which has no reflection one way or the other on your credit ability. The secured credit card is offered by most credit card companies in which you take a certain amount of money and put that in a, a bank account, and then you draw against your own money. As long as you pay on time, you will begin to make a track record of being a good payer. After six months of doing this, you will then become more of a uh, recognized person as far as the credit reporting agencies are concerned and begin the process of building your score. So if you don't have any credit at all, that's the way to get started. And the good part about that is that you don't have any black marks if you don't have any credit at all, if you don't exist to them. So you get off to a good start and keep it that way with what you're going to learn in this course. Now, once you have uh, paid the uh, payments, hopefully very much on time for the six months, then maybe you can see the credit card company or apply for a loan and get an unsecured card with a low credit limit. The low credit limit uh, will gradually be raised as time goes on and as you prove yourself through your history of timely payments. Now, on another matter that I think is of great importance is that on the um, credit uh, reporting agencies provide consumers an, uh, an opportunity to explain negative matters. Now, I'm going to tell you flat out that it never is worth it. And the reason for that is that if you make an explanation, it does not affect your credit score whatsoever. The credit score deals just in numbers. It's a mathematical score that's compiled by mathematical formulas. Consumers, of course, are, are tempted because maybe they don't, don't feel they really owed the debt. Maybe the debt was exaggerated in their mind. Um, maybe the debt was, um, in their opinion, reported prematurely or unfairly, and they want to explain that, which is natural. But the only thing that will accomplish is to slow down your application for a mortgage, if that's what you're after. In other words, consumer explanations can have a negative effect 
but they have no real positive effect. For that reason, don't even think about bothering with them. Now, the FICO score ranges from 300 to 850. Uh, as far as the far end of the scale is concerned, the 850, less than 1% of people have an 850 score. So don't get upset or don't get any kind of anxiety about trying to achieve a perfect score. Once you get a score of 760, you can get the best rates anyone has to offer. Anything over 760 is gravy. Well, it's good to be over 760, not only because of bragging rights, but because it does give you some leeway in case you have some kind of a financial hiccup down the road, or you stumble or forget a payment somewhere along the line, or, or something of that nature. But other than that, uh, a fair credit score is around 660, a good credit score is 720, and an excellent credit score is 760. Now, for our next chapter, we're going to discuss what elements go into the FICO score and what importance can be attached to them. Your FICO score is compiled from five different components, and I've graded them in the order of their importance, and I want to explain each component to you. All of these work together. I told you previously that the FICO score is actually a kind of a sum of moving parts. And for that reason, sometimes any particular action that has an effect, it's impossible to tell precisely what the effect will be because the other parts have to be known as well. We know, we know, we know most of what goes into the FICO scoring formula by reverse engineering the effects of, of different actions on credit scores. FICO stands for Fair Isaac Corporation, and they are a, a company that also has a, a few secrets of their own, kind of a secret source we refer to it as, uh, in order that people cannot game the system with complete certainty. But we're well into the 90% certainty on what it takes to have a good FICO score. And if you follow uh, these instructions and listen carefully, you will have a good FICO score. And you will make some progress very quickly, too, although it does take time to make a, a FICO score with the lasting kind of value that you want for the rest of your life. Now, the first component that we're concerned with is, as I mentioned in the introduction, on-time payments. At 35% of the total score, on-time payments is the one thing that if you do not do anything else, you should start making each and every payment on time prior to the due date. Now, as they, if you've got late payments that are several years old, they recede in importance because age is a factor in FICO scoring as well. It's a very strong factor, as a matter of fact. Recency is considered to be more predictive of your uh, likelihood to default on future loans. So that if you have... Uh, uh, late payments from two years ago, three years ago, uh, they, they do have an effect on your score, but it does recede as time goes by, and usually there's very little you can do about it, except making sure that you continue to be on time month after month. The new timely payments will outweigh the older untimely payments, and your score will improve gradually that way. So there's nothing more important than making your payments on time, no matter what the sacrifice is concerned. You can tell by looking at your credit card statements that making the minimum payment doesn't make much progress, usually on the, on the principle of the loan. But the fact that you made at least that on time is critical for your credit score. So at least make the minimum payments, even though it may be discouraging that you're not making any real progress on your loan. And timely payments count for any type of loan, be it credit cards, be it mortgages, be it automobile loans, any type of loan. There is nothing more important than timeliness. I cannot stress that enough. Now, the second uh, category is debt to available credit ratio, and this takes some explanation. If you have a, a available credit of $1,000 and you owe $500 on it, you have a debt to available credit ratio of 50% which is not that bad, but it's not that good either. 
You want to try to keep this as low as you can, preferably below 20%, even below 10% if you can. So it doesn't matter how much the actual credit that you have is. You could have $10,000 worth of credit, owe $5,000 on it, and you would still have a 50% debt to available credit ratio. This is the aspect of your credit uh, scoring process that you have the most control over. By paying down <clears throat> particularly credit card debt, you improve your debt to available credit ratio and you will see immediate uh, upward swing in your FICO score. For instance, from $1,000, if you owe 500, when you pay 300 more, that would lower your debt to available credit ratio to 20% a very good ratio for only $300. It's not how much credit you have available to you. It's how much of the available credit you use. So in, in that sense, if you did get a uh, increase in your credit limit from $1,000, let's say to $2,000, and owed, still owed the 500 on it, your debt to available credit ratio would become 25%, which is good. So the increase in the credit limit would have the effect of lowering your debt to available credit ratio and increase your score by a dramatic amount. Now I know that it seems kind of odd that it would work that way, but it does. And it's very important and you have a lot of control over it. From month to month you have control over it. So that if you're planning on a major purchase such as a house or an automobile, if you can get your debt to available credit ratio down in the months prior to the, uh, applying for the loan, you will have a much higher score and make a better deal for yourself. The third component is length of credit history. Now, credit scoring does not discriminate based upon age, but of course the older you are, the more credit history you have, and it's a positive factor in your credit scoring. So what is done by the credit bureau is they take the oldest credit account you have as 50% of length of credit history, and then they take the average length of credit that you have as a, the other 50%. So the length of credit history is an important component. It's 15%, but uh, in, in most cases, there's little you can do about how old the oldest account is at this point so that it's not a factor you can uh, use to uh, manipulate the, the score quickly like you can the debt to available credit ratio. But the important thing to remember about length of credit history is that when you apply for a new loan and you get it, you're bringing your average age of your credit down because now you have a brand new account in the mix with no history at all. So for that reason, it's always best to remember that not to go applying for accounts all over the place and, and doing it when you don't really need credit. Apply only for the credit you need when you need it. The fourth component is type of credit. The kings of types of credit is mortgage loans. Mortgage loans have more weight in the scoring formula than anything else. Those with really high credit scores usually have had mortgages for years, long, long many years, mortgages faithfully paid on time every month and it helps to really develop the really high credit scores. The second type of uh, credit is uh, credit cards, which most of us uh, use and hopefully don't abuse. That's called the revolving loan in that it changes from month to month. And uh, like all types of credit, paying it on time is the most critical factor. But this is a factor that usually you can affect your debt to available credit ratio by paying this down. Now, the third type of a loan is an installment loan, which we usually think of as a car or a boat. That's another factor. The credit scoring formula likes to see all three types of credit that you, to prove that you can handle different types of credit, not just one type of credit, so that your credit score grows by having a, a, all three types if you're, if you're able to afford it. As far as car payments are concerned, uh, the debt to available credit ratio is not quite as important as it is with credit cards. If your goal is to pay down your debt to available credit, stop with your credit cards. But the car payment, like any other payment, must be made on time. And the more of the total of the loan that you've paid, 
a healthy a debt to available credit ratio, the better. Category number five is called inquiries. An inquiry is when you apply for credit, either with a bank, for a car, or when you're looking for money. That person makes an inquiry of the credit bureaus, and the inquiries will knock your score down only for a year, but they knock it down on an average of five points, depending on where it was in the first place. So you don't want to have a lot of inquiries. Even though they don't only last a year, they do have a negative effect. And you may ask why, and the only reason I can tell you why is that uh, inquiries have been proven through the years, especially when they're in excess, to possibly show a sign of a person that's having some financial trouble or is headed for some financial trouble. Another good reason not to apply for credit you don't really need. So the FICO score broken down like that uh, isn't really quite quite so uh, prepossessing or so scary. When you look at the components of it, it's actually quite manageable. And for that reason, um, I'd like to reiterate one more time. It goes from 300 to 850. Our goal is 760. The average credit score is somewhere around 680 or so nationally. Uh, but 760 is when you will find yourself able to get anything at all. Anything above 760 is just for show.